Hello, and welcome to the webinar titled Exploring a Career in the Paleontology Field, hosted by the Geological Society of America, the American Geosciences Institute, the American Geophysical Union, the GSA Geobiology and Geomicrobiology Division, the Society for Vertebrate Paleontology, and the Paleontological Society. My name is Talia Baer. I am GSA's Diversity and Career Officer, and I will be moderating today's webinar. Your presenters today will be Rebecca Hunt Foster, who is the Monument Paleontologist and Museum Curator at Dinosaur National Monument, and Matthew Carson, a Senior Paleontologist at Paleo Solutions, Inc. in Los Angeles, California. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. Everyone has joined this webinar on mute. At the top right-hand corner of your screen, you will see a control panel. You will use this control panel to ask questions during the webinar by typing them into the questions box. Because we have two presenters, please direct your questions to a specific presenter. We will address questions at the end of the webinar during the Q&A period. This webinar will be approximately one hour in length and is being recorded for on-demand viewing. An email with the playback link will be sent to you in two days. There will be a short survey at the end of the webinar. Please take a moment to fill it out. Your input is important for the organizations hosting this webinar and for our presenters in tailoring future webinars to make the most impact for you. With that, let's begin the webinar. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Matthew Carson. Um, before we begin, I wanted to give a quick thank you to the Geological Society of America for asking me to participate in this webinar for the Jewish Career Series, as well as a quick thank you to the other organizations that are helping to promote or sponsor uh, this webinar. There it goes. Uh, to tell you a little bit about myself, I am a senior paleontologist at Paleo Solutions, located at our headquarters in Los Angeles County, California. I have both a bachelor's and a master's degree in geology with specializations in paleontology. And I have nearly six years of experience uh, doing mitigation in the private sector. So the goal of this webinar is to really help young students, um, young professionals, early career professionals gain insight into what mitigation paleontology is, why you should consider it as your career of choice, what to expect once you're in the industry and working and how your career will advance through time and how to prepare for a career in this industry. Okay, so you may be wondering, what is mitigation paleontology? Um, to understand what mitigation paleontology is, you need to understand the importance of fossils. Um, fossils are the re remains of once living organisms that have been uh, permanentized or replaced by minerals and sediments, and they tell us information on the evolution, the extinction, uh, of organisms through time, climate change, and ecological change, um, and relative geologic dating, which can be corroborated with other sorts of dating techniques. And so they provide information on Earth's past as well as Earth's future. But once a fossil is destroyed um, or disturbed in the ground, the scientific information that it entails can never be replaced. Um, so therefore, Fossils or paleontological resources are considered important non-renewable resources. And so since the 1970s, with increased infrastructure development, um, particularly in renewable energy or transportation, uh, utility work, etc., in the Western United States, um, there has been the potential that there could be negative impacts or effects on these paleontological resources. Seeing that as a potential problem, uh, various uh, government agencies, both at the federal as well as state and local level, um, have developed regulations in response that uh, hopefully in preserve and protect these paleontological resources. And so, mitigation paleontology really is centered in resource management with the goal to reduce negative effects or impacts to possibly scientifically significant fossils to acceptable levels. Uh, basically making sure that fossils are um, and our data are properly collected so the project can continue on while paleontologists still have access to that data. So mitigation paleontologists really are um, concerned about regulatory compliance during all stages of a project. 
Um, so they may help draft paleontological assessments used during the planning of a project that would be overseen by a particular government agency. They may also review uh, museum records, geologic maps, uh, published and unpublished literature, databases, geotechnical reports um, to determine the depth of sediments, for example, as well as construction and grading plans. So all used to determine what's the likelihood that fossils could be present in an area and could be negatively affected by the construction activities of a project, such as a road or a pipeline or uh, housing development they have on potential fossils. And so based on those studies, they develop and implement strategies or mitigation measures to reduce those effects to less than significant levels or to acceptable levels where science can still use that information and the fossils can be enjoyed by the public. And so any fossils that are recovered during these sorts of projects eventually are curated and put into a museum for display for scientific use. So what does that actually mean? Most uh, field technicians would start off in construction monitoring. That's where most mitigation paleontologists begin their career. And so they'll be on construction sites implementing those strategies or those mitigation measures that were determined during the planning stages of projects to make sure that fossils aren't being destroyed and to salvage any fossils that are recovered during the excavation. So you may be on a big construction site where there's um, newly exposed rock sediments, so you'll be recording stratigraphic information and lithologies, falling behind various earth moving equipment, uh, which can be quite large and dangerous to work around. Uh, so you can see at the bottom there's the circle the bulldozer and on the top we have what we call a scraper. They grade away sediments layer by layer and the paleontologists would follow these equipment operators and look for evidence of fossils. And when fossils are found, actually recovering them or recording that information and determining whether they're significant or not. If so, then they would be collected for museums. And so these construction sites can be quite large um, and quite intense with the number of equipment that are excavating sediments in a particular area. So this is a project here from California um, along the edge of the landfill, actually. You can see that there's, I think I counted up to like 15 different earth moving equipment that are scraping and, and removing sediments layer by layer. And so it becomes quickly like a game of frogger jumping around all these equipment looking for fossils uh, that could be exposed. And if fossils are found, diverting and potentially halting construction equipment and diverting them around to the find so you can evaluate it and potentially salvage it uh, for scientific study. And so you can find some pretty cool stuff. Um, this is that same project. Uh, we were able to find large marine mammal bones, uh, the whales, sea cows, things like that. Um, the picture on the left, uh, one of the construction monitors was following a particular bulldozer and happened to notice this fossil. And after exploring it around, discovered several other fossils. Um, this one on the left wasn't necessarily considered significant because of its preservation, but it gave indication of other fossils in the area. And lo and behold, we did find others. So the picture on the right shows some of the excavated fossils that were discovered, um, which include ribs, long bones, uh, vertebra, uh, those sorts of fossils. And they often are uh, removed from the site and either stored on the site to be eventually transferred to a museum for curation or um, scientific study. And so you can find some pretty sizable uh, fossils on these sites. So this is again that same project where we found a fairly large baleen whale, which could have been any species. And so we can see that this is just one piece of it. There's actually three. Um, the other two aren't captured in this photograph. So you can see that the field paleontologists are jacketing the fossil and getting it prepared to be removed from the site while construction equipment are working around them. And so that way, once the fossil is removed, they can begin uh, excavating in that area again once the fossil and the scientific information is recorded. So kind of cool. That kind of stuff. And you can find fossils in all kinds of areas. Um, this is kind of a neat example from the city of Los Angeles when they were excavating uh, the Purple Line extension, their train system. They found a number of Pleistocene megafauna, so mammoths, giant crowned sloths, camels, horses, 
and various other megafauna were discovered during the excavations of this uh, particular uh, project. So you can find fossils in urban areas, which is always a surprise to environmental planners about how you can dig down 20, 30 feet and find all kinds of fossils underneath where buildings once were uh, situated. So that's kind of cool. Other activities that mitigation paleontologists do um, are field surveys, which are used to supplement sort of the paleontological investigations that are done during the planning of a project. So you can go to very remote areas or urban developed areas and walk the project alignment, prospecting for fossils, looking for fragments on the surface, any indication that the sediments that may be present or impacted during construction could yield fossils and rec making recommendations on how to proceed with those fossils. So we work in all kinds of areas. Um, this particular example is from Wyoming, the Bighorn Basin, uh, with Lake Cretaceous sediments. And so our, our field staff were walking and surveying the area and they found a number of fossils on the surface. Um, so small teeth, bones, plant material, invertebrate material, such as ammonite, and other fossiliferous source of sediments, sediments that have a potential of yielding fossils. And so that information is then incorporated into environmental planning documents that then make mitigation strategies or measures to describe what to do when a fossil is discovered during excavations for a project. Where museum does it go to? Who should uh, communicate about fossil discoveries and those sorts of things? Okay, so now that you know a little bit about mitigation paleontology, um, why should you consider this as a career option as opposed to some other option in paleontology? Well, this comes down to supply and demand. There is an increasing demand in the private environmental consulting sector for paleontologists, uh, particularly those that specialize in mitigation. Uh, this is in stark contrast to what we're seeing at universities and museums where Funding for those opportunities are becoming smaller and smaller. And so this is a great opportunity for students to get into a new field for paleontology. There's also um, a number of opportunities for growth, whether it be in the technical or on the business side. Um, and so that's, again, more opportunities for growth and mentorship of younger paleontologists as well. And I think what a lot of students like to hear is you don't necessarily need a graduate degree to get started. I myself started with only a bachelor's degree when I first entered the field, when I wasn't sure grad school was right for me. I worked for about a year in Montana doing some mitigation work, um, and then later on completed a master's degree. Um, I do recommend getting a master's eventually um, because it will give you sort of the technical and uh, writing abilities that you'll be using later in your career but you don't need a master's degree or even a graduate degree to get started. Usually just a bachelor's degree is required. And you get opportunities to study new fossil localities on lands usually unavailable to scientists. Um, many projects, you know, they are located on federal land, but also they cross into private land where scientists may not have access to those particular fossil sites or that property to inspect the land for, for fossils. So this gives you an excellent opportunity to expand the knowledge of paleontology by discovering new localities and working with the public potentially as well. And there have been a number of fossil discoveries from mitigation as well as hundreds of new academic publications from the research that's been done on the on, uh, material mitigation sites. One of the uh, publications that sort of sticks in my head was just, uh, I think a month or two ago, a publication was published on a new species of mastodon based on a large number of specimens that were recovered in California at a mitigation site. So it's definitely a lot of opportunity to really make significant contributions to science. Okay, so what sort of career trajectory could you expect? Um, this is kind of a confusing diagram, so looking left to right with early, middle, and late career opportunities. Uh, you may start as a field technician or a paleontological monitor or a paleontological field technician. They're all kind of the same thing. Um, those are the individuals that are in the field doing construction monitoring, recording new field and new fossil localities and fossil data, and eventually transitioning into a leadership field role where they may be a field lead or even a laboratory manager. Uh, training new field staff and making sure that 
larger projects where there may be multiple people working, that data is being collected at an appropriate level. As you reach in more into your middle career, uh, you may be assigning be assigned more writing tasks, such as writing reports, doing these ontological assessments that are used in the planning stages, potentially coordinating and scheduling people in the field to make sure that all projects that need paleontologists are adequately staffed with paleontologists. As well, and then also health and safety. Um, working on construction sites, there's always going to be health and safety concerns, whether it be uh, rattlesnakes or heat stress or working around those large earth moving equipment. Health and safety is a really big uh, issue in our industry. So there's a lot of opportunities for that in that uh, part of our industry as well. And eventually those, uh, those sort of career trajectories usually funnel into some sort of project manager role where you're overseeing an entirety of a project or at least a significant portion of a project, um, making sure that things run smoothly, data is being collected, reports are being written, things are on time, um, and that sort of level of detail. Um, and then as you reach into your late career, you may become a principal investigator, which is more of a technical level, someone who may have strong technical knowledge of paleontology and fossils in a particular area or a particular geologic formation with a lot of experience managing projects and other sorts of tasks, such as permitting and working with agencies. Or you could go more the business route, um, working to partner with other consulting firms who maybe don't have paleontologists or other sorts of um, business development and marketing needs to expand the number of projects and really grow the business. And then eventually that all funnels into usually a regional manager or a program director or some sort of executive, senior executive role through time. So those are just one possible career trajectories. Um, some people stay on the field side and because they love that, and that's totally fine. Other people move into the business side. There's a lot of options, is, I guess, the point that I'm trying to make. So there's many possible trajectories you could go with your career in this industry. So what should you do to prepare for an industry uh, like mitigation paleontology? Um, you should definitely have a strong knowledge of geology. So having the, uh, I guess, the core geology courses, such as mineralogy, sedimentology, uh, stratigraphy, geologic mapping, field geology. I'll talk a little bit about field camp and field geology in a little bit. Um, other courses that could be useful are your biology courses, where you're learning about evolution, ecology, zoology, comparative anatomy, really any vertebrate course would be really helpful. And then paleontology courses obviously would be things to consider taking if your university offers them, not all of your universities do, but most at least have a natural history, an intro paleontology class or a dinosaur class, something that's um, for a broad audience you should definitely take that if it's offered. But um, if not, definitely take vertebrate paleontology, invert, um, paleobotany sometimes can be helpful. Biochronology, having an understanding of the fossils in their stratigraphic and geologic time, uh, and being able to use that information in reporting. And, this, and probably most importantly, is field methods, um, being able to record taphonomic information, the orientation of the fossils, for example, in a particular rock. Um, being able to record the cements and the lithology the fossils are found in, and making plaster jackets so that way fossils can be stabilized and removed from the site safely without being destroyed in the process. Those are all really good uh, classes and experiences to gain in your undergraduate experience. Other courses that could be helpful um, that maybe aren't necessarily thought of by paleontologists to take, but I think really, really do make someone stand out. Um, that's having some GIS, some geographic information system courses, some mapping courses where you're dealing with digital maps. Um, other courses that could be helpful are your environmental compliance and regulations classes. Um, paleontology luckily doesn't have too many laws that apply, but it does give you exposure to some of those documents, some of those environmental planning documents that uh, outline a lot of the environmental concerns, one of which may be paleontology, for example. So it gives you some exposure to those sorts of documents. And then most importantly, technical writing. 
uh, as you advance in your career, you will be writing more and more and more. And so having the ability to write in a particular style at a particular level is immensely important to advance your career. So definitely consider taking a technical writing or even a scientific writing course if you can. So going back to field camp very uh, briefly, um, I would say most field camps are in the Western US um, with some exceptions. So I kind of highlighted the red states that I know a lot of schools do field camp in. There's obviously other ones that maybe I'm not showing here. But these states are also the states where most mitigation paleontologists are hired. And so when you're looking for uh, these sorts of careers, your field camp or your field course may be the, one of the biggest field experiences you have coming out of undergrad. And so that's really what you're going to want to highlight. And so I really recommend doing your field camp in those locations. And then I'm specifically calling out California because most of the steady mitigation paleontology work is in California. Um, there's a number of projects in other states, such as Montana, Wyoming, Utah, but the vast majority are in California due to the laws of Cal that are in California. Um, I started in Montana myself and moved into Wyoming and other states um, because I had done some field work there, and that eventually allowed me to transition into working in California. So just keep that in mind. Okay, um, so what other sorts of experiences should you get during your education and your preparation for this industry? Um, volunteer, volunteer with museums or in academic laboratories. Those are excellent opportunities for you to gain some of that field paleontology experience. Um, I started one summer during my undergraduate uh, volunteering with the Museum of the Rockies in Montana, excavating in the Hell Creek Formation, uh, Triceratops and Hydrosaur dinosaur bones. That, along with my field camp, was what effectively got me my first job. So volunteer with museums and in academic laboratories are always looking for volunteers. It's an excellent way to get uh, some experience also connecting those um, sorts of tasks. And I'm sure Rebecca, when she's presenting her spiel, will also have other sorts of opportunities that you can also use to gain that medication or that uh, field paleontology experience. And then if you go to any conferences, usually there's some field paleontology field trips or short courses or other sorts of um, what I would call professional development classes. Um, feel free to always enroll in those if you can. Uh, they're great opportunities to get experience and it can always go on your resume. So those are always great opportunities. Some other things to consider that might not be super obvious, um, feel free to complete the 40-hour HAZWOPER training, the OSHA training. Um, most of it, to be quite frank, is not going to be relevant to paleontology at all. Um, but a lot of projects and a lot of employers expect their employees to have that training. And it's pretty tedious and not really relevant, but it just makes it so much easier for you to be pushed onto another project without having to go through all the training. Um, so just go ahead and do it if you can. If you can't, some employers are able to just help you get that certification, so don't worry too much about it, but it really does help, especially with some utility projects uh, where electrical concerns, for example, may be a particular issue. Um, so it really just helps us to have that training just to, to say that, yes, I understand some of the safety concerns and I have understanding of some of the safety issues that can, occur, that can arise on these sorts of projects. Okay, and then, you know, when you are in your undergraduate program, a lot of times it's senior capstone or a master's thesis. Um, those are great opportunities to get some research experience and incorporate some field experience as well. Um, so definitely take the time and take some time to think about what you want to do for those particular projects when you're finishing up your undergrad in your last few years. Um, those are great experiences for you to really get some hands-on paleontology experience. And then what's also perfect timing is the best practices in mitigation paleontology uh, is being published by Murphy et al. And it's coming out pretty much any time now. I think it's in press. Um, it'll be published in the proceedings of the San Diego Society of Natural History. I kind of gave you guys the, the citation there, so feel free to write that down. Um, <clears throat> that paper will discuss some of the practices that mitigation paleontologists do, <clears throat> including some of the um, tasks and best practices in the field and in writing documents and environmental planning. So it's really a good primer on what this industry is, 
um, goes into far more detail than I could do in 20 minutes. And so I highly recommend for students and maybe professors reading this paper. It's a great resource for uh, students who may be interested in the future. Okay, so you have your college degree, you have some field experience, now you're wondering, okay, where do I find career opportunities? Um, most paleontologists, mitigation paleontologists, are going to be hired by private environmental planning and or consulting firms, which can vary in size and scope. Some firms work on a whole slew of different things from biological, cultural or archeological, paleontological, groundwater, um, hazardous waste, civil engineering, et cetera, to smaller firms that maybe specialize in maybe one or two areas. And so it just really depends on what you're looking for, what you prefer. Um, I've worked in both large firms and small firms. With larger firms, you may get a variety of work on smaller tasks, whereas on a smaller firm, you may see a project from start to finish. So it gives you different kinds of experiences. So if you ever get the opportunity to work for both, I highly recommend it as a great way to see both sides of of the industry. And so to finding jobs, you'll notice that there are, should be a lot of job postings on websites where environmental planning and consulting firms post. So indeed.com, classdoor.com, LinkedIn, these are all great websites to begin looking for uh, mitigation paleontology positions that may be available. Of course, you can also look at academic and professional organizations. I believe when I was first looking for my uh, first mitigation paleontology career, I saw a posting on a website that's affiliated with Society of Vertebrate Paleontology, SVP. So that's a great opportunity to look at those different websites and see different positions. And then it also doesn't help, or excuse me, it does help uh, to network with your university's geology and paleontology alumni and professors. Um, many of them are well connected, may already know people that are working in this industry, um, paleontology is a very small field, so we usually all kind of know each other, I think. So you can quickly discover who is working in this industry and may have some insight on where you can apply. So there's always great opportunities to really stay in touch, um, pick up the phone and give them a call, send them an email. Those are great opportunities to have sorts of discussions and to begin uh, finding avenues for careers. And then, of course, I always recommend make a LinkedIn.com profile. It's not the most exciting of social media, um, but it is a great way to begin uh, building your CV online and your online presence where you can have a face and your picture together so people know who you are when they meet you and uh, begin adding some of your alumni and some other people that you work with over time, maybe some of your classmates as well. Um, it's a lot more important when you advance your career, um, not so much when you're a field technician, but as you advance your career, it becomes more and more important. So it's not super important early on, but something to consider. And then lastly, be prepared to move where the jobs are. Um, this is a particular issue, especially in California, which has the most positions open, but the fewest number of undergraduate paleontology programs, I would say compared to many other schools that have rigorous paleontology programs. So be prepared to move from wherever your university is to a state that may have mitigation paleontology. Um, so just keep that in mind that that may be a factor when you're done completing your degree. So plan ahead a little bit, both financially and in terms of your professional development as you go on. Okay, um, so you're looking for jobs, you find some job openings. Um, what will a entry level job posting be like? Uh, so I just kind of took a screenshot of one particular job posting that I saw. Um, and kind of highlighting the qualifications and the things that a lot of firms are going to be looking for uh, when they're looking for their entry-level field paleontologists, so people with a bachelor's degree or a master's degree in paleontology, geology, or biology. Um, I would caution a little bit on having a biology degree, um, and many biology degrees may not have the geology and the sedimentology experience. So if you're going to do a biology degree, I would also maybe recommend minoring in geology so you can get some of that experience um, because you really do need to have a strong background in geology. I say that only because I know a lot of vertebrate paleontology programs are transitioning towards biology, so just kind of keep that in mind. Um, 
And then also make sure you have good verbal and written communication skills. Um, this is sort of where that technical writing ability comes in that I recommended. Uh, so being able to communicate with construction foremen, project managers, um, agency personnel that may visit the site, different kinds of people, different kinds of audiences of different knowledge sets. So being able to communicate both verbally and in written form is really important and really going to help you advance your, your career. So just keep that in mind as you're moving forward. So plus you'll be taking detailed uh, notes each day on the construction and the fossils that you're finding. So being able to write effectively and clearly is really important. Um, you may work independently or as part of a team. Um, when I first started out, I worked in a small team doing surveys in Montana. Eventually, I moved into working by myself on a construction site, um, monitoring a particular area with a, in sort of in, within a region, and working basically by myself independently. So you, be able, so you should be able to work both in a group setting and as an individual, um, being comfortable with that. And then also because we are geologists and fieldwork is a big component of this industry, being able to uh, hike at long distances and rough terrain under extreme temperatures, whether it be hot or cold, um, though hot, I think, tends to be more likely. <laughs> um, so just being able to be, to be able to do that and to be comfortable doing that, um, including carrying out the equipment, uh, such as your rock hammer, field notebook, um, camera, other sorts of Hands, for example, other sorts of fossil salvaging equipment. Those are things you should be able to carry over rough terrain if necessary. And then another thing that always comes up, um, and I think this is becoming more of a trend with uh, students, um, if possible, make sure you have a valid driver's license, car insurance, and a reliable car. Um, some projects may require you to supply your own vehicle for all projects. Other ones may um, give you a four-wheel drive vehicle if it's required for a project, but then otherwise use your car, your own personal car. So just make sure you have a reliable vehicle so you can get to a construction site or a field survey or even to the office if you're doing tasks to arrive on time. Uh, this is an issue that I think is going to be becoming more and more uh, prevalent as younger people are stretched in with college expenses and so but just make sure you have a vehicle that can get you from point A to point B that's reliable. I think that's really important. And so for starting salary, um, it can vary incredibly a lot, especially the first few years when you're first getting started. So I give a range of 30 to 55K a year. And that really just depends on construction scheduling, availability of you to work on certain projects, your ability to travel or to, um, uh, you know, things like that. So just be, be aware of uh, your education background, for example, that could factor all into your your expense and your uh, salary. Okay. And so wrapping up here, um, some resume and CV tips and tricks. Um, prepare a full curriculum vitae. Um, I know some people online aren't sure whether you should write a short resume or a long one. Just make a full CV. It's perfectly fine. They want to see everything that you've done paleontology-wise. So your field experiences, field camp, your thesis, relevant coursework, volunteer work, uh, any past employment that's relevant, all this information is funneled into agencies who may determine whether you are or not qualified to work on their projects as a paleontologist. So any, any information that you can provide is very helpful. And once you start working, keep a running list of the projects that you work on, so that way you can uh, recall that information as needed. Okay, and so wrapping this up, as you're applying, make sure you have a full CV, as I said before. Um, prepare a technical writing sample, so a senior capstone or a master's thesis are great examples. Even just a poster abstract is fine. And make sure you have a cover letter that really markets your experience in paleontology and your skills in paleontology to your potential employer. And proofread, proofread, proofread. Uh, you'll be surprised how many uh, cover letters aren't uh, Preferred. So just have multiple people review it before submitting it. And then when you come into the interview, come prepared with questions such as safety, training, highlight your field experience, and communicate your availability and flexibility. So that's really what they're going to be interested in. So that way they know that you can, they can schedule you on their projects. Okay, and so to conclude, mitigation paleontology really is a growing industry full of opportunity. Um, 
the role of a paleontologist in mitigation is to protect resources from development and infrastructure and make significant contributions to science. Mitigation paleontologists must have a strong background in field geology and paleontology, and most employers are located in California, but there are other places such as Wyoming, Utah, and Colorado um, that have offices that hire paleontologists, but projects may span the entire Western US. And then environmental planning and consulting firms do hire the most, um, and those range in size from, from international to national size firms to smaller boutique firms. And it just depends on what you're interested in. And that's pretty much it. Um, I think we were going to transition over to Rebecca. Yeah, yes, thank you, Matt. Um, we'll go ahead and transition and hear from Rebecca Hahn Foster um, right now. And you will have to unmute your phone before beginning, Rebecca. Thank you. Hi there, everybody. Thanks so much for um, waiting for me. Sorry about the technical difficulties earlier. So I real quick just wanted to go through what it is like to be a federal paleontologist. Um, I currently work for Dinosaur National Monument, and I am their paleontologist and also the museum curator. There are a lot of jobs that are available in paleontology, as Matt just mentioned. Um, some of those jobs can be things like museums or mitigation, fossil preparation, paleo art. Volunteering is really important. This is a great way to build your skills. Um, so there's a lot of really great career opportunities out there. I am a federal paleontologist, and when you think of working in federal paleontology, you might automatically think of the National Park Service, but there's also a lot of people that work for the Bureau of Land Management and some folks that work for the U.S. Forest Service as well. They're all real great people, and I have the numbers of current positions out there that are held by people who are actually doing a paleontologist job. So within the National Park Service, we have around six right now. In the BLM, there are seven. In the Forest Service, there are two. But those numbers vary because um, keeping in mind that some of the folks that have jobs in the Park Service, BLM, or Forest Service may do other work, such as they may be a geologist or a um, interpreter to the public talking to folks about um, fossil resources within different parks. Um, there are folks that work in museums or people that work in mitigation paleontology for the National Park Service. So there are a variety of different career paths that can be um, in the federal government. So what is my job specifically? I'm, I'm the paleontologist for the monument, but I'm also the museum curator. So I kind of do two different jobs. Both of them keep me pretty busy. Um, I've worked for the monument since August of 2018, so I'm kind of new to the National Park Service. Before that, I worked for the Bureau of Land Management as a district paleontologist for about five and a half years. So my job basically um, entails managing and preserving fossils on public land using scientific principles and expertise. I do everything from public outreach. I go out and talk to the public. I do tours. Um, I try to um, answer letters from schools, do Skyping sessions, a lot of museum curation work lately. Um, we have a big collection here of fossils, but I'm also um, in charge of the archaeology collections and our plant collections. So I kind of have to be diverse in that way. Um, I try to go out and do field work and do surveys. We might need to go out and look at fossils that somebody has found in the field or um, look for new fossil discoveries. So there's that. That's, of course, the fun part. Um, I help our partners like museums and um, universities get permits to come out and do their research and excavation. Um, we do long-term monitoring of these fossil resources, such here at Dinosaur National Monument, we have the um, Carnegie Bone Wall, and that's what most people come here to see. And so that is um, one of the resources that I manage, paying attention to that, making sure all the fossils are safe. Um, and then we maintain databases of surveys and reports and resumes and all those um, fun things that need taken care of. Um, it's a great job. As far as laws that go that 
pertain to fossils, we actually have the Paleontological Resources Preservation Act, which was passed in 2009. And this is a law that tells us that we need to manage and preserve fossils on public lands using scientific principles and expertise. And the agencies have been um, developing different things that PURPA mandated, such as um, making fossil, you know, making public awareness campaigns, um, helping people be educated better about fossils, um, doing inventory and monitoring, things like this. So the law was signed in 2009, and the final rule for both um, BLM, Park Service, and Bureau of Reclamation is actually going to be published this summer, which is a wonderful thing. Um, the Forest Service rule came out in 2015. So PURPA is a really good thing to educate yourself about if you're thinking about having a career as a federal paleontologist. Some of the things that I am working on right now, um, or that I just finished working on, it's been a very long winter, is grants. We were writing a lot of grants to do a lot of the work that we want to do, not only this summer, but for the years to come. We do grant writing up to three years out. So we have to think kind of down the road as to what our projects are going to be. Um, I've been doing an inventory of all of our museum options, uh, objects, 100% inventory, so that means going through everything and looking at all the objects and making sure that they're in good condition and that we know where they are. Um, working with a lot of researchers, trying to get people to come to the park and do some work um, and getting all their, their permits set up. And then also getting ready for our summer intern projects. This summer, um, the interns that I'm going to have on board are going to be working um, on a lot of museum work, rehousing our fossils, and making sure that they're in stable environments and being well kept. So that's um, something I'm really looking forward to starting. I occasionally get to work on research. Some of my research projects at the moment include working on ornithomimid dinosaurs um, from Utah. So that's exciting and something I enjoy doing. So some of the questions that people were asking me online when they saw that I was going to be doing this um, presentation um, were what are some of the hardest aspects of your field? And, you know, I don't like to start off with a negative thing, but there are a lot of interesting dynamics within paleontology. Um, I think one of the hardest things is just that there's not a lot of jobs. Paleontology is a lot of fun and a lot of people want to do it, um, but there's not always enough jobs to hire every single person that wants to do the job. Um, so that can be kind of a bummer. And the pay can also be low occasionally compared to what some people might be hoping to get paid. Um, paleontology is very popular in the media, and but unfortunately it's something that you um, don't see getting a lot of funding for. So museums and field work and stuff are, are traditionally um, not funded highly. Work-life balance is always challenging. Um, I think to be a paleontologist, you really have to love paleontology and you have to love what you do because it does become kind of part of your life, but it's also managing the, the paleontology that you love, but also managing your hobbies or family time and off time and just trying to find a happy medium and all of that. Um, informing people about paleontology and um, why it's important is, is always challenging, but that's... Um, can also be a very positive thing. I think it's very exciting to tell people about paleontology and try to kind of spark that curiosity in the natural world. Um, there's a lot of different ways to be a paleontologist that people don't think about. They may think, oh, well, if you're going to be a paleontologist, you're going to be a professor at a university or work in a museum. And that's not always the case. There are a lot of really wonderful paths in paleontology that you can take and a lot of different things that you can do and a lot of different ways to be a paleontologist. Um, we don't always get trained for the admin stuff that we have to do. A lot of that we have to learn on the fly. Um, but I think that's just part of, of being a good worker is learning, learning new skills, being diverse, and being able to just um, figure stuff out. Um, some of the more rewarding parts of the job, though, like I mentioned, is helping people appreciate paleontology and helping form those connections. Um, one of the things I really love is working within local communities to help them appreciate and value the fossils that are from their area. A lot of folks may not know about the fossils that come from their, their backyard. And so it's really great to do that outreach to your local community, talk to them about what kind of fossils are from that area, why they're important, and why we need their help protecting those because they're the eyes and the ears on the ground 
and we can't be everywhere at once. Um, and finding fossils, of course, is great because there's nothing like uncovering a fossil and knowing you're the very first person to see that fossil. Somebody asked me if I have time for research. Um, I do a little bit at work, but the, the bulk of my work is not research-based. And I would say that's pretty correct for most federal paleontologists. We might get to do a little bit of that as part of our job um, that we do, but doing sole research just as a paleontologist with the federal government is not really the way it's done anymore. Um, but there is a little bit of time to do research, but most of the research I do um, takes place in the evenings and on weekends on my own time. Um, some of the best advice I was given when I started my career was by one of my professors at the University of Arkansas, Walter Manger, and he always said, geology is learned through the soles of your shoes, not the seat of your pants. And I think that's very true for paleontology as well. You're gonna learn more paleontology by getting outside on the ground, visiting museums, touching fossils, um, working with fossils, doing research projects, than you will just reading about it. So definitely get out in the field, get some volunteering experience, um, check with your local museum to see if they need any help and um, look for those kinds of opportunities because they're very important. So when I look at kind of my career trajectory, I decided in middle school, high school that I was really interested in paleontology and started writing to paleontologists who lived in my area. I then went on to the University of Arkansas for my undergrad and Texas Tech for grad school. And I tried to do as much field work as I could during this time, um, sometimes too much. My professors would try to rein me in and <laughs> remind me that I needed to finish my classes too. I tried to do as many internships as I could as well. I did a GeoCorp internship um, right after grad school at the um, at Glacier National Park, working on stromatolites, which was kind of a change for a dinosaur girl like myself um, to be able to go all the way down to the Precambrian and work on stromatolites in one of the most beautiful places on the planet um, was really wonderful. And it was a great introduction to the GeoCorp program. From there, I kind of got my first job working as a fossil preparator at Augustana College. Um, working as a fossil preparator is really great. You get a better understanding of anatomy. Um, preparing is a very good job. It's, it's a lot of fun. Um, and I think everybody should take a chance to be a preparator because without preparators, we wouldn't be able to do paleontology. Um, so it was a really wonderful experience. I'm glad I had the chance to do that. Um, from there, I went on to a job at the Museum of Western Colorado as their um, kind of their field technician, running their field program, and as their collections manager. And I did that for a number of years before moving to the Bureau of Land Management, where I worked for five and a half years, and then just recently with the National Park Service. Um, during the time in between grad school and working at Augustana College, I had done my thesis work at Big Bend National Park, and I also worked with the national parks to write a lot of technical reports for them. And this helped me to improve my technical writing skills while also giving me sort of a better understanding of how um, federal paleontology works, and especially within the National Park Service. And I also did some mitigation work, um, working in the summers and in the falls, going out and looking for fossils on a lot of these construction projects. These were all really great experiences that helped me to get the jobs that I've had. So speaking about the GeoCorps program, this is a really wonderful program that I both was able to participate in as an intern, and then now I'm able to actually have my own interns, which is kind of crazy, but it's been wonderful. I've had so many excellent interns over the years. This is a picture of some of them that I had when I was at the BLM. They did a lot of variety of projects, GIS projects, um, mapping dinosaur tracks, giving tours, doing education and outreach, helping at fossil excavations. And this is a really good opportunity to take 12 weeks, usually out of your summer, and to get in the field and learn what a paleontology job is like, often working for the federal government and sort of getting your, your toes in the water and seeing all the diff different variety of things that can be done. So I definitely... Um, encourage you to check out the GeoCorps program. A few tips, um, apply for more than one position, reach out to the supervisors who are offering those, um, write the cover letters for the internships you're applying for. 
Um, I've seen several sometimes that are for other places, so it kind of makes you think maybe you aren't really interested in the position that you're applying for with me. Um, answer all the application questions, even if you um, haven't done something, try to work it into why you want to be working um, at that particular area. Um, complete an application. We don't look at incomplete applications. And um, the new positions are being, being posted on May 1st, so definitely go to the website and check those out. So really quickly, I'm just going to go through how to get a job as a federal paleontologist. You're going to want to go to USA Jobs at the website and create an account. You can also set it up to email you when positions come available. Um, there will be a little box off to the side that will tell you if the position is open to the public or if you need to have federal hiring authority of some sort. So pay attention to that so that you know um, if you should apply for the job. But even if you can't apply for the job, it's good to look at it to see what kind of skills you would need. And then the pay scale and grade will kind of tell you what kind of experience you need to be able to apply for that job. And these are all listed on the USA Jobs website. So the job will usually tell you kind of a summary of what you would be doing, the responsibilities, and then the qualifications that you'll need to do that job. And sometimes it's not cut or dry. Um, there's options where you can have education and experience or just education. Um, doing a position like GeoCorps can give you that AmeriCorps experience, which can, which can count towards volunteer experience. Um, you don't need a paleontology, or I'm sorry, a PhD for most of these jobs. Um, some people get worked up and think you have to have a PhD to do some of this stuff. You don't. We have a great combination of both um, people with PhDs and people with master's degrees that work in the federal government, and you do not have to have a PhD for a lot of these positions. Not all of them, but a lot of them. You may be able to have a good combination of education and experience. The occupational questionnaire will have all the information as to if you qualify for the job. This is a good way to see what the specific skills you're going to need to do that job are. So even if you can't apply for it, look over those. These are scored. So the higher the score, the more likely you are to get passed on for an interview. But answer honestly on those things. Do not lie to try to jack your score up because, unfortunately, when we look at your resume, we can tell if you've fabricated a little bit on the questionnaire. And I have seen that happen. So always be honest on those things. As far as your resume goes, um, here's a list of things that you should have on your resume. Always be honest on that. Check and see what kind of documentation they're going to need, and then you're probably going to need to have your transcript. So why should you be a paleontologist? Um, it's a lot of fun, and it's great to teach people about the history of our planet. It can be really hard work, but it's definitely good work, and I um, highly recommend becoming a paleontologist. Here's some resources that you can check out. Our um, National Fossil Day is an event that happens every year. The National Park Service and the BLM both have web pages that have newsletters and information on how to apply for permits or um, just things that are going on in the field. Um, always check out USA Jobs for those um, job opportunities. Um, check out the GeoCorps page for internships. And there's my email address if anybody would like to contact me later offline with questions. I really appreciate it. And sorry to go through this so quick, but I appreciate you hanging in there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rebecca. We do have a few minutes for some questions. And if you would like to stay on for about five minutes after the hour, we can continue answering questions. So I am going to start um, with a question for you, Rebecca. Uh, so this question um, comes from a student asking about whether GIS is recommended for federal research paleontology careers. Yes, absolutely. I would recommend everybody take GIS. Um, GIS is becoming something that you need either maybe not on a daily basis, but definitely on a weekly to monthly basis. It's a wonderful skill to have. I've found that it definitely increases your, um, your chances of getting a job or an internship. So I highly recommend that everyone take GIS. Okay, great, thank you. This question is for Matt. Um, can PhDs still be viable mitigation paleo candidates? Uh, yes. Um, most of the skills, many of the skills that you learn in a PhD aren't necessarily applicable to mitigation paleontology since it's a lot of applied paleontology as opposed to research. 
A lot of PhD research is very focused, for example, whereas a bachelor's and a master's degree person may have a more broad uh, understanding of paleontology and a more general understanding of paleontology. But that shouldn't dissuade you. For sure, uh, people with PhDs definitely can apply. Um, you may still have to start at the beginning as a field technician, um, but having a PhD often means you have a lot more writing abilities that other people may not have. And so definitely don't let that dissuade you. Definitely uh, consider applying. Thanks. And just one more question, Matt. So, um, do you work on? Did you work under a professional geologist when you started your career? And do you need to have your professional geologist license to work in any of the states you work in? That's a good question. Um, I have worked with professional geologists, but is it a requirement? Absolutely not. There's only a few agencies that require working under a professional geologist. Um, generally, the professional Geology uh, tests are not applicable whatsoever to paleontology. Uh, but a lot of the geology tests are for, for PG or for hydro and geotech and things like that that aren't going to be applicable to paleontology. Um, so, no, you do not need to have a PG uh, certification. Okay. Thank you. And Rebecca, um, what advice would you give for a student whose university does not offer any paleontology courses? Definitely see if you have any advocational groups like rock collecting groups or fossil clubs. Um, you may reach out to your local museums to see if they have any opportunity to work with the collections, especially if those may have fossils within them. Um, I know it can be hard sometimes living in areas where there aren't paleo classes, but there are ways of working around that. Also look for um, volunteering and field work opportunities in other places. Um, a lot of times people are willing to take people on for the summer volunteering to, so that they can get some of that experience or look for those internships. Okay, thank you. And another question for you, Rebecca. Do you work with researchers outside of the government? Most of the time, yes. We work with a high number of researchers from outside of the government. I'd almost say I work with more researchers outside of the government than I do inside the government. Okay, thank you. Well, I see that it's um, 12 noon, and so I would like to conclude the webinar, but thank you so much for joining us today, and thank you to our presenters. And please contact us if you have questions um, after the webinar. There will be a short survey after we close, and we would very much appreciate your feedback. So please um, take a moment to fill that out. Thank you so much, and have a great day. Goodbye.